Hi, I am Seth. Okay. I'm joined by my tiny robot child, BB90, because um, <laughs> I accidentally threw my pocket this morning, so she came with. Um, I am doing a talk today called In Defense of the Linear, Telling Tailored Stories, or Why a Linear Narrative Can Be Good, Actually. Because <laughs> I have a lot of feelings on this topic. Um, so, I'm Seth. I hate making slides a lot. Um, I like narrative, which you could probably gather by the stream this talk is in, it was also the name of the talk. Um, I'm a narrative designer, a writer, a podcaster, I do photos, I direct a podcast network, I like robots, and I also like to fight people, especially on narrative and game design. Um, not like physical fighting, so don't worry about that, I'm weak. Um, <laughs> you can also find me on Twitter, at Wanderlust, and uh, feel free to tweet out anything about this talk on the hashtag that is for this conference, because you can't embarrass me, it's fine. Um, yeah, so... I, I did this, like, and then I was like, am I allowed to swear on this? And I was like, you know what? Who cares? It's fine. Um, so, what the fuck is linear narrative? There is a lot of kind of narrative design styles in games. Like, there's a lot of people talking about narrative in general. There's, like, academia, there's, like, movies and all that stuff. In, like, game design and practical applications of narrative design, there are kind of, like, different ways of doing it, different ways of structuring your narrative in games. So, like, there's modular, open-world narrative, which is really cool, and it's, like, when you play World of Warcraft, it's, like, how the story is broken up into things and you can like in, go to different quests and like build the story slowly across different areas or like in Grand Theft Auto where you kind of can do the story however you want, whichever direction you kind of want. And so, uh, yeah, those are kind of built up in a way that it doesn't lead you through one particular story thread and you're not railroaded along one direction. You can kind of just do whatever you want and the story kind of happens. Um, branching narrative, like Bioware, Elder Scrolls, like, I mean, Elder Scrolls is also open world, but like Bioware kind of stuff, basically, where you have kind of a linear thread you follow, but you can make choices, choices change things, blah, 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 whatever. You get different endings, um, even if there's only three. There's emergent narrative, which is like the thing everyone's talking about these days, so you probably know a bit about it. It's like the system designed into the game, interact with the player, and you make the story through that. So you kind of create your own personal story as you play the game, which is... Um, Kind of a difficult thing to design like an actual like big story thing that you want people to get from your game if you just have that. Um, but it's a very cool thing that everyone's talking about right now because it's fun with games and it's doable with games on like movies and, get, and books and stuff. There's procedural narrative, which is procedural, so that's kind of, you know, whatever. And then there's linear narrative, which is just Halo or like Kingdom Hearts or whatever where you just play through the game, and you get the one story every time, and it's always the same. And it's like, who cares? Compared to all that cool stuff, what's the point? Obviously I care, because I'm doing this talk about it, and because I said I was going to fight about it. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about why Taylor narratives can actually be good, because they can be. Linear narrative does not mean a boring game. Games with linear narratives are often considered movies, broken up by gameplay, so like, you know, Halo. Last of Us, that kind of stuff. It's like, play game, get a cutscene, play game, get a cutscene. You can't do anything during the cutscenes, you're just kind of there watching it. And so you get a little bit detached. Which I mean, a lot of people don't actually care about that stuff. A lot of people do. A lot of people are like, you're taking away my control and I want to play this cutscene and how dare you kind of thing. So it's like, dependent on the game and the player. But also, that thinking isn't actually entirely true. Like, that is true for older games with linear narratives that they are like, Play, cutscene, play, cutscene, no interactivity in cutscene. That is very standard for a lot of games. But it's not necessarily true anymore, and it's not necessarily true into the future either. Like, you don't have to follow that formula just because everyone else did, because it's what was the dumb thing. If that makes sense. So, one thing that linear narratives have is emotional strength. They have a lot of power for telling a very powerful story. I said power too many times then, but you know. So, games with linear narratives can have stories that are like, you know, the writer and the narrative designer, the writers, whoever's directing the story kind of tells that story. It's their story that they're telling, which means that they have a lot of influence over how it's told, how the player experiences it, how the ending happens, and the emotions that the player is supposed to feel during the game, as opposed to a branching game where, like, the player can have different paths and they may encounter different things and they'll get, like, a different interpretation of the story and different endings. So they may not get, like, if you have an overarching theme, they may not get that because they chosen a different thing that doesn't match the thing. So like think Joel and Ellie at the end of The Last of Us. Like the ending was powerful. I'm not gonna say what it is because I don't know if I'm spoiling people. I don't know when spoilers are up for these games. Um, but like the ending is powerful because we as players cannot make the choice for Joel. We know like at the start of the game, 
Okay, wait, okay. So the start of the game, this game works because you play as Sarah, Joel's daughter to begin with. So you play as her and then swap over to Joel and try and save her life. So from the from the very point of the game that you begin from, you know Joel is a du- a different, a separate character in the game apart from you. You know you're playing somebody else's story as opposed to like playing Shepard, who is your character. So because the game starts you off with Joel already as an NPC who you then take control of, you have that kind of foreknowledge that you're not always him. And then you control Ellie later in the game, so you also have that knowledge that Joel is somebody who can be hurt, or somebody who you could possibly lose, and you may not always be him. So this game reminds you throughout the game that this isn't your story, but you're playing it. And so at the end, you can't make a choice for him. Joel's going to make his choice, whether or not you agree with him, because it is Joel's story, and it's the story of the game. And that's why that choice can hurt a lot, because you're like, don't do this, it's a bad idea. Um, and I, I remember like people have been like, why didn't we get a choice in the game? Like, because none of that game gave you a choice for Joel. Like, you could choose which guns you use, but you couldn't choose like whether or not you're gonna like you know stab someone who was like one of your teammates or something. You couldn't just like kill Ellie because you wanted to. So use your structure to pace a powerful journey and a powerful ending because you can in these more so than other narrative styles. But it's also not your story. <laughs> like, you may control it and you may be able to write it and have all these intentions, but it's still the player's personal story. Like, it has to be the player's story in some form, or else what's the point of them playing it? They're just watching your movie, but interacting with it, basically. Like, narrative designers, who's seen Westworld here? (laughs) There's a narrative designer in there who's the worst, and he gets really mad because the people who go into the game interact with the robots, and they interact with them wrong. He's like, they're ruining my story. And I'm like, yeah, that's games. Like, it's game design, buddy. They go in and they ruin your game. Like. Come on. Um, they're going to go in, and even if it's like, you know, The Last of Us or like Halo or whatever, like they're bringing their personal selves to the game. Like, I, when I'm playing Halo, I'm like, yeah, I'm Master Chief right now. I'm this big guy because I want to be tall. Um, so <laughs> I, I got lost there. Um, <laughs> so you got to let it go somewhat. You can't, like, be like, I'm going to force these, this, these meanings and these questions upon the player. You can only introduce the player to them and hope that they'll get there. So you got to give the player agency, obviously, because otherwise, why would they want to play your game? Um, find ways to do this in any way you can, basically. I mean, it doesn't mean that you like they get to walk around freely during cutscenes and like punch people because that can be weird and kind of distressing for the player to just be able to like, punch somebody who's talking to them. Um, but just find ways to let them make choices in their own way. Allow exploration of the narrative in whatever ways work. I'm going to touch on that a little bit later. Um, don't front load exposition. Like this isn't actually related to this slides I need to put in there. Don't throw a player into a game and then be like, here's like five minutes of dialogue being like, this is the lore of our world, and blah, 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 because players are gonna be like, can we shoot things please? Or whatever, like, it's pouring, it's not, a, it's not a book, like, put lore in places around the game that they can find if they want to, but don't force your, like, don't build a whole world bible and then force it down your player's story, because they may not care. They may, like, make it interesting for them, so they will, but they may not. And then, yeah, find ways to give the player choice in how they play. So they may not be able to actually make choice in the dialogue, but give them ways to react to what's happened to them, even if it doesn't actually have influence on how the story goes in the end, um, if that makes sense. I'm going to touch on that a little bit more later. I'll let you take a photo. Oh, wait, I have more. <laughs> Align player motivation. How did that get down there? Um, Align player motivation <laughs> with character motivation. I screwed this up. Um, that I'm also going to touch on. Now, good thing I put that there. Um, okay, so when, when the player isn't playing their own character, so like they're playing Master Chief or like Drake from Uncharted, Nathan Drake from Uncharted, um, you've got to align their motivation with the character's motivation or else they're going to feel kind of disjointed and like not know why they're doing what they're doing. So you can give them a question. So it's something that the player is asking with the player character. They're like, I want to know this and the player character wants to know this. So we both are in this together. It could be an emotion, so something that you throw at the character at the start, like a really powerful emotional thing that gets them aligned with the character emotionally so that they're feeling what the character is feeling and they want to do what the character is doing because of that. You can give them a goal, so something that the player wants, like whether it's just be the cool boss or whatever, like it's something that the player really wants that aligns with the PC or what the game wants. And these can be revealed to be different later, so you can subvert these things later on, but at the start, make a way to align it. So games that do good linear narratives, The Last of Us, which I keep talking about. What Remains of Edith Finch is a really good example of bringing interactivity into cutscenes and telling stories without 
making a player watch stuff, so that they're still interacting with what's happening, and their interactivity fits the theme of what they're being told. Um, if you haven't played that yet, really good narrative. Um, Inside, freaking love Inside. Tacoma, also new and also really cool stuff that it does with um, conversations and whatever. It's really good. Shadow of the Colossus, old classic. Sabelle, Chabelle, I don't know how to say that, which I just played, also really good. The Beginner's Guide, which is one of my favorite games ever, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. So, subverting motivations. Let's so touch on this now. I don't know why I wrote that. In games where the player character is an extension of the player, so like in Bioware or Elder Scrolls or like anything where the player gets to customize their character and then make choices and do whatever they want, why did I make that different thing? You can't easily subvert character motivations without it being really jarring because it's their character. You can't just be like, by the way, Shepard is actually really evil and he's going to kill everyone now. And you'd be like, what is happening? This isn't Shepard. This isn't how it works. But in linear narrative games where the player character that the character that you are playing as a person, um, they're often their own character. Like whether they're like they may be a cipher character, which means that there's nothing about them um, that so the player can imprint on them, and that still works. Um, but often you get stuff like you know like Wander from Shadow of the Colossus or Joel from The Last of Us. Um, they're their own thing, and so you can use assumptions of motivation and player tropes and or tropes to challenge your player's idea of the story or game. So like, who has played the Beginner's Guide probably knows that like. Hang on, let's go back. No, not that far. Um, beginner's Guide. No, I want to go back further than that. Hang on. Sorry. There. The goal. You have a goal that you get given at the start of the game. The goal is to play through this kind of interactive documentary and play these games and learn about these games and just experience because the character, Davey Reardon, who was talking to you, is like, I really want to show you these things because it's important to me and I think it's important to you this too. And so you're like, you go into the game and you're like, that seems fair. These games seem cool. I'm going to do that. And so your goal is to try and like, learn the things that he already knows and he wants to impart upon you. And later on in the game, that gets subverted. You're like, oh shit, this was a mistake. I've made many mistakes. Um, in The Last of Us, I'm, just like, I'm gonna keep this open so I remember what games I was gonna talk about. The Last of Us has the big emotional thing at the start that you draw in with Joel is that you lose your daughter. Like, you as Joel, your daughter drives in front of you and you're like, no! And so when you find Joel, like when you come back to Joel later on and he's like sad and older and you're just like, this is my fault too. Like I did this too. Um, Firewatch is also a good example of like it gives you that little like twinish kind of thing at the start, which is just beautiful and like draws you in. So when you start off as Henry at the start of Firewatch, you're just like, this is my fault. <laughs> I've done everything wrong. Um, and those, so those are kind of ways to give you kind of like the emotional resonance with the player character. Um, even Insight. Insight kind of has the same thing as um, Beginner's Guy, where it subverts the thing at the start. You have the you have an assumed goal that you need to run away from something, and the game kind of goes with that. And so you kind of have that fear of the of the player character that you go along with to begin with, because the game just throws you in and you're running. Um, Tacoma has the like uh, what was I what was I gonna say the what the question? Tacoma has the question at the start. You go in and you're like, I don't know what's happening, and um, you get like thrown into a space station where everything's just chaos, and it's just, everything's floating everywhere, and you're just like, oh my god. And so the question there is like, instantly you're just like, what the hell happened here? Which aligns you with the player character, who's also like, I don't know what happened here, I'm gonna find out. So like, these are ways to kind of, at the start of games, just, you know, align your character with your player. If that, does that make sense to anybody? <laughs> okay, cool, I saw like two nods, great. Um, so, <laughs> but like, yeah, so subverting so motivations, basically you bring the character in with those, those things, like a question or an emotion, and later on in the game, you can, you can, you don't have to. This is just, this is just if you want to be fun and like make a weird thing, like a beginner's guide, um, or inside. Like it can be a jarring thing that resonates with players a lot, or it could just be bad. So <laughs> it's up to your own discretion whether or not you want to actually do this. Um, yeah, I, I find this very interesting. So that's one thing you can do with linear narratives as well. Exploring narrative, which is something I just talked about. So the story in linear narratives doesn't just have to be told by a cutscene or by a, like lore books that you pick up. Um, try to find creative ways to bring interactivity to games without explicit choice. So like games that aren't branching or whatever. Um, you can do that through like art design, environmental storytelling, and like plotting out your physical or digital space or whatever in ways that the character can kind of like wander around and explore and like find interesting things around it. Like if you've played against Finch, the house is beautiful and I spent a lot of that game just wandering around the house looking at everything and finding the story through that. Tacoma does this in a way that you can like interact with holograms to see like kind of see what would be cutscenes normally, but you can like walk around and rewind things and force things and like 
conversations move on, you find other conversations. It's done very well. Tacoma is amazing, by the way, if you haven't played that. Um, that does this very well as well. Dialogue. So, like, <laughs> side stories that you can play through, or, like, idle dialogue that, like, characters, like, in Dragon Age, when you're running through the areas, characters will just say stuff. Um, that's ways that you can explore, you can help a player explore the narrative without actually, like, they don't have to do things in particular, like make choices, um, like barks that NPCs do, questions that characters can ask, so like they can still ask questions that kind of branch, that seem like they branch, but they're not actually branches, they're just ways to get more info, but they're optional ways to get more info, so they don't have to. There's also, like you could do multiple solutions to puzzles or quests, so like, I mean, like it's not a linear game, but you know, like Breath of the Wild, it's like, <laughs> just do what you want, figure it out, and like just make it work, like that kind of stuff, um, which is obviously a little bit more to do, but that's one way to do it. <sighs> Why is this happening to me? Thematic exploration. So like giving them ideas or symbolism or like the potential for deeper analysis but not like forcing it on them is a way that like me personally, I love exploring games in that way. Like if a game gives me enough to like build weird theories off of, I'm like, this is good. This is what I want. Um, so that's what Firewatch kind of did for me was that when I was playing it, I was just like, is it aliens? It's aliens. It's aliens. It's got to be aliens. I was same with Virginia. I just think everything is aliens in games. Um, so thematic exploration can also work. There's another thing I thought of as I was saying this, and I can't remember what it is now. Um, yeah, also Shadow of the Colossus, great example for like world exploration, because it's not actually, you can only find the, find the Colossus in order. You can't go out and just fight anyone whenever you want. Um, and so that is a linear game. It progresses very linearly, but that world is like mostly open, and you can explore it, and it is gorgeous. And it tells you a lot about where you are as well. So like that's one way that you can do that kind of stuff. Um, Oh, with dialogue as well, you can do like, you know, audio things that you find, like in Bioware, like you find the little tapes that people have done that tell you some story stuff that you don't have to listen to, but you can. Um, just like little optional things like that, that players can choose to do, but they don't have to, and it doesn't really affect the game in the long run, but it can add more to their experience, and also give them that feeling of doing things in the game. Is there something else down there that I just lost? <laughs> no! What is it? Hang on. No, how do I escape this? Here we go. What is it? You know what? Who cares? It's gone now. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Whatever you were. Oh, I hate everything. I'm sorry. I'm usually not this bad at technology. There we go. Game versus story. This is the thing that comes up a lot with um, narrative design stuff and game designers and just people in general. They're like, the story, it's a game. It should be a game, not a story. Like, that's for movies and books. And it's like, this is such a good medium for storytelling. It's just different. It's a very different medium. Um, so will linear games actually games? Yeah, obviously. Like, you're still playing the game. Like, come on, chill out. Um, <laughs> it's not a matter of gameplay coming before story or story even coming before gameplay. It's a matter of balancing the two and weaving them together to best tell your story. We've got an amazing medium with games because it's interactive and it's got so much powerful, like, emotional telling and, like, getting people really involved in games and doing things in really innovative ways. But often it comes between like, is the story more important or is the game more important? I don't know. It's like, no, mush them together and make them both as important as each other. Games can be more than just like, you know, games, like what people think, like general audience of like the world thinks that games are. They can be way more than that. And obviously most of us know that because we game designers and we play games and stuff. Um, narrative design communicates your story. So it's not like a non-essential thing. It's not something, it's not optional really. Like, you don't have to have a narrative designer, so I would like that if you hired me. Um, but thinking about narrative and how you're building it in your game is very important for telling a coherent story, a powerful story, even just like mobile games. Like you kind of, you build like narrative design into that stuff. Like I mean, there was like Candy Crush, just crushing candy, but like it's built in a way that like it all makes sense. That so, like you're like, yeah, I'm crushing candy, I'm getting stuff, but like. Everything in the game is built towards, don't give me that look. <laughs> it's built towards you believing that you are there crushing that candy right now. Like, it doesn't make any sense what I'm trying to express. I can't do the words right now, right now. But, like, nothing in the game jars against that kind of thing, if that makes sense. Like, it's not like they're just throwing random dialogue in front of you and being like, you got to save the princess and blah, blah, blah. Like, it's, it's built to, hello, oh, yeah. It's thematic design as opposed to narrative. Yeah, but that's still part of narrative, though. Like, thematic design is important because you're still communicating a story in some form. Like, the player is engaging with that and building their own story of, like, it was just like, I beat 10 levels in a row without losing anything. Like, it's their own kind of story. I'm just meaning that might be why people think that it's a different thing. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the problem, is that, yeah. Thematic design is kind of part of narrative design. Like, it's all interlinked, but yeah, it, it, it is like that. And, like, it's, it's all part of making it all match and, like, mush. So it all kind of gets mushed in as well. Like I remember um, Liam Ezler did a thread on Twitter a while back and 
about what narrow design is, and a bunch of people were like, but this is other kinds of design. He's like, yes, it's all, it's all mixed in together. It all mushes. Um, so like, even if you're just making like a dumb little game that you don't really care about that much, just like consider like, how do I best communicate the player's personal story or what I'm trying to do or what the game is trying to say? And narrow design comes in handy there. So in my ideal world, we wouldn't dismiss story and be like, dismiss, dismiss story and be like, you know what, we don't actually need story. Like three months before launch, let's just cut it all out. Um, but also we don't be robots, so obviously we're not in that world. Um, <laughs> come here. Why prioritize one over the other when we can not do that? Just because we can theoretically make everything emergent and like player-based and exciting and interactive and not tailored at all, why should we ignore other styles of storytelling? Just because somebody like you personally may enjoy like, you know, like XCOM or something doesn't mean that every player in the world is going to want to play that. They may want The Last of Us or like Assassin's Creed or like Candy Crush or like some random arts game that they found at HIO. Um, Linear narrative is a structure that allows people to tell personal and powerful stories that may get lost when it comes to choice or procedural stuff or whatever. Linear narrative gives us an opportunity. And also, let's be real, there's a smaller scope of linear narratives. You're not building like a giant world. You have probably a playlist dialogue in a branching game. And you're like, I'm going to build a giant branching game that has like 10 endings. You're like, no, you're not going to like that. Like, I was writing Love Watch, had two endings. So much writing. <laughs> so much writing. Um, and it's, you know, it's like Final Fantasy, which isn't entirely linear, but there is linear narrative. It's driven by one story. Um, <laughs> it probably won't be open world. It could be, but you're going to want to do open world narrative and that modular narrative. Like um, Horizon Zero Dawn has a very driven linear story, but they build that like they build an amazing linear story narrative that's like meshed in with modular narrative and like side quests and stuff in a way that works really well. And like that's not just a pure linear narrative game. Um, generally, easier to plan out than emergent narratives because you can't entirely predict what's going to happen when you start mushing systems together um, that you haven't bug tested a lot. You're just like, oh, things are happening, and I'm not quite sure what. Um, so if you're trying to tell a particular story, it may not be the best idea. Also, less time spent fixing those things. Um, it doesn't even need dialogue, like inside. No words. It's amazing. Condense, just condense everything. When you're doing linear and you just want, you want to tell a story and you want to tell a particular, you want to portray a point and like a thing that you want to say, condense it, just condense it as much as you can. Like people always like, this game didn't give me 80 hours and it's like, if you're trying to tell like a particular story and prove a certain point or like communicate an idea, by the end of 80 hours, somebody's gonna be sick of that if that's what you're trying to make a game for. Like there's, there's no point making a game that long for that. Um, chain narratives, which are which is the thing I made up, so don't judge me. Um, <laughs> they're branching games that aren't actually branching games. They're branching games that branch out and then always come back to one ending. So no matter how many times you play them, how many choices you make, you hit the same ending every time. It's the same story. It's the ultimate bottleneck. Um, you can let players explore, like, they're good. These are good. I love changing narratives. It's like, um, this is something I have a lot of feelings about, is giving people limited choice within games to give them moments of power, like, perceived power to express a theme that comes with that, um, to express powerlessness and, like, the inevitability of the ending. Um, it, it has a lot of thematic and also interactive things that you can bring in with this, this particular thing. Um, like, so Firewatch, which I love a lot, and Night in the Woods, which is also really good. I don't know if this is spoiling the endings by saying they chain errors. But anyways, um, <laughs> these are games basically in which you play the game, and you're like, okay, this was inevitable. I always had to lead back to this point, and it's for a reason. These games do this, like, this points Night in the Woods, where it gives you, like, two options of what to say, and you'll pick an option, and the game just says something else. It's just like... It, like, it, your character's drunk, basically, so you can choose what to say, and the game's just like, you're saying this instead, because you're drunk, and you don't have control, and, like, that communicates that you're very drunk, and you don't have control of what you're saying quite well. Um, so this, like, chaining narratives and limited choice have a lot of power within linear narratives to give a player choice, or, like, communicate a certain idea, or whatever, without, like, you know, giving them, like, ten different endings. Though people sometimes will expect that if you give them any choice at all. So basically... There are lots of ways to do game narrative, and not any one of them is better than the other. It just depends on what story you're trying to tell. Linear narrative can be really good. I mean, like, look at the games that win the narrative awards every year. <laughs> like, they're always linear narrative games, but they're always really good games. Like, it was Uncharted 4 last time. I haven't actually played that, so I can't talk for it, but it was, like, Inside and Firewatch and, like, those kind of games were, like, in the narrative awards. And, like, Inside, you wouldn't really think of as, like, a, you know, linear narrative game, but that's 100% what it is. It's, like, a platformer linear narrative game. Um, and it's 
a beautiful game and it communicates its story so beautifully through art design and music and color which is art design I just love the color and just like the pacing of the game every part of it god the sound design is so good I love that game um, every part of it communicates a story really clearly with no dialogue it's a very short game but it is beautiful um, so they can be really good <laughs> experiment when you're doing linear narrative and you want people to like have interactivity with dialogue or whatever's happening experiment look at what other games are doing in that same area like in the same structure like narrative games in general like see what they do because there's a bunch of really interesting oh, I forgot a thing I was going to talk about a really interesting like experiments that they're doing and like different ways of interacting with the story which is like like Tacoma and Edith Finch they did really cool things um, also <laughs> brief intervention ignore this for now um, when it comes to letting players discover like digital or physical spaces the reason I say digital spaces also because Sabel which I don't know how many of you have played that I think it's like a well known game um, <laughs> in that you can like explore the character's desktop and like go through her folders and look at her selfies and like find all these things and it's a very like authentic game because it's real photos of like her real past and it's a game about her real life um, and so you're going through this and it feels very personal and very kind of, you're invading her privacy and looking at her things and like learning about her as a person. And you don't have to do that. It doesn't influence the story at all. Like it's just optional. It's weirdly, like it kind of gives you a feeling of really being in somebody's computer. And that's another way that you can give the option to discover the narrative through like the design of the world, even though it's not really a world, it's just a desktop. But yeah, you know what I mean? Um, you know, it's back to this. Use your narrative toolbox. So basically, mean like all the different styles of narrative design, all the ways that your narrative could be implemented. Just use it all. Don't like be like I'm doing this one game, so I'm gonna use this one thing. You're like use everything you can use. Just mix it all together and make something interesting. Consider your story. Consider what you're trying to tell. How much is it important? What is the core of your story? What is the premise? What is the bit that you need, no matter what, and you need to communicate. You need to have that solidly down, or else you will lose it during the game development. You need to have that thing just there. It's like a solid core of the apple. They don't have solid core. Solid core of the avocado, just there. In the game. You just need to have that there, okay? I, I lost that analogy. But anyways, balance the game and the story. Make sure you don't lose what you're doing. Come back to it and get others to look at it and know, know, know it. Know it to your core as well, your avocado core. Find ways to involve the player in the story wherever you can. If you can find a way to do it, do it. Just because you can and just because it's fun for the player. Like... There's that word, like, fun, like, nobody really knows what it actually is because it's different to everybody, but, like, a lot of people just, like, even if they, even if it's just an optional thing and they don't actually want to do interactivity, like, they don't have to. But if they want to, then that's cool, and they can enjoy that. And it's a way to kind of bring the player into the world more and bring them into the story more. Tell personal stories. I mean, not, like, literally you have to, like, tell them your autobiography, but, like, tell stories that feel personal and will, the player will feel as personal stories. And also <laughs> learn to let go of your story. Don't own it completely once. You send it out there and you want players to interact with it, it's gonna be theirs too. Like not to the point that they can tell you what to do with it, but it's gonna be theirs, that they will have it in their heart and like it'll sit with them, if that makes sense. So now, go tell good stories, because I really wanna play more good story games. I think that's everything that I had. Yes, it is, there we go. Um, what's the time? Where's my helpful person? I got 15 minutes, wait. You go real fast. I, yeah, I talk real fast there. Um, do I have any questions? I don't know if I see anything questionable. Yes, hello. <laughs> um, so changing narratives, which I think is a really cool plan for it. Um, so you talk about not only like turning at the end, but also changing during the game as well to, to like bring the options into one point yeah. a bunch of those. Yeah, well I mean generally in even in branching areas you'll often do bottlenecks anyways because it's so much easier to deal with the player and just the world in general if you do that. Otherwise your branches will be extreme. Like I think at some point in Love Watch I had like a full branch thing, and I was like, you know what, this is too many branches in this particular choice section here. Too many variables, too much. I had to cut it because it was just like, no, the player's not going to like this, I'm not going to like this. Um, obviously that was a limited choice game anyways, but um, yeah, even with big branching games, they'll often have bottlenecks that you'll always come back to, and choices that you won't have choice over no matter what you do. Um, obviously the bigger AAA games have that less often because they have a bit more freedom with more assets and more money and more time. Um, but yeah, in chain errors in particular, yeah, you'll often come back to that stuff. But a lot of the time as well, you won't necessarily know that it's happening unless you replay the game and you come back to it, you're like, ah, oh, so no matter what I do here, right, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, but don't you think the inherent risk of that is that you, you turn off the player at that point because they're like, oh, everything I do is an illusion. Like, it's pointless and you can, you can get this kind of disengagement at that point. That comes, yeah, that's, that's something that comes a lot with replayability of these kinds of games. Like, 
Um, games like Firewatch may not hold up to a replay if you're not super in love with the story because you'll realize very soon that there's not much you can actually do. And like all it does is influence your relationship with Delilah, um, like your personal relationship with Delilah, but that doesn't really mean anything for the game itself if you're not involved in that. Um, Oxen Free has issues with that. I love Oxen Free. It's a game that builds itself to be replayed, but as soon as you start replaying it, you're like, ah, yes, I see how you've built this game that I cannot do much. Um, like, that game does have a lot of choices that you can make, and it does change the outcome, but the way it's built is you play a lot of the same stuff, and it's like an eight hour game or something. Um, so, yeah, that's definitely a problem. And I think, like, when it comes to things like Nine in the Woods and stuff, like, making the theme something that feels inevitable and not making the story something so big that not having ultimate choice at the end, like ultimate variables at the end that affect things, is important. Um, if you're building a chaining narrative, you have to make sure that it is contained, like the story is contained, the theme is built around the idea of it being chaining, like the reason you're making it chaining suits that, if that makes sense. Hello, yes. Yeah, I think um, from like what I've seen, um, uh, if, if, if you're coming across something like that where it's a, a bottleneck that could potentially turn players off, Definitely, like you said, tying it into theme is really helpful. Like you think about like Bioshock, the, the whole sort of theme is like choice is meaningless, and, and you can't really do anything to change your future. Like uh, even if you're like, oh shit, like this is gonna upset people. Like it's it's better to tie it into something like that because then you can pretend like I wanted it that way all along. You know? <laughs> yeah, Bioshock's a good, actually, really good. I always forget when I'm talking about chain narratives, but Bioshock's a really good example of a chaining narrative because. The game does give you choice, and then like no matter what you do, the game's like you're actually going to kill all these people anyways. Um, you know the game has issues, but it is an example of like the way it's done exactly like you said. Like the point of the game is you don't actually have choice, um, and so when you're making these choices, hello, I'm going to get to you soon. When you're making these choices, you just kind of hit that wall constantly of like I don't have choice, I don't have choice. And the end of the game is like yeah, you don't have choice. That's the point. And whether or not it works with people, that is what the game is trying to say. So yeah, when you're going chain narratives. You don't, and I mean, bottlenecks aren't always obvious, like, unless you know game design quite well, or you have played the game before, like, at least once, um, then bottlenecks don't really come up that much, but you do have to be aware of them, what they're doing, like, if you're writing one in, <laughs> be aware of how the player's going to get there and how it's going to go back to what they want. Um, but in chain narratives, yeah, just make it suit what you're trying to tell. Yeah. Another thing that's sometimes used to justify uh, branch and bottleneck structure is um, genre traditions. It's a lot easier to work with if it's something like a murder mystery where there's a convention in the genre of maybe you'll talk to the widow or maybe you'll talk to the suspicious bartender because you, in those sorts of stories, you know that those two options will ultimately lead back to the same killer because there's only one murder. Yeah, it seems quite feasible to look into either of those parts of the Yeah, time, like so. there's a lot of games that kind of like, we're going to do this thing soon, but you have choice of what to do beforehand, and that's kind of like one of those ways you can do a chain there that all makes sense. Yes? Um, <clears throat> what's your opinion on, or like, what are your thoughts on games that have, I don't know if there's a term for it, but extension endings, where there's an end to the game, and almost all paths lead to that, but if you do certain things in the lead up to it, you can then continue on from there and get a set, like a second ending or a third one. Um, give an example. Um, well, I literally cannot give an example. That's one. So <laughs> there's someone, so I'm going to go with Undertale. Yeah, finish Undertale. Um, yeah. That's right, it's a people call it. Yeah. Something, along, something a little bit along yeah, the way. Wait, did other people have yeah. games? It weren't Undertale because I actually haven't played. Far Cry 4? Far Cry, I haven't played. Um, very minimal example of it, but one you do know. Uh, Mass Effect 3. Like how if everyone dies, you don't get that final five minutes. Oh, yeah, only yeah. well, like if you yeah. kill one, yeah. yeah. Um, and that, would you consider, I suppose the question is, yeah. would you consider that linear and yes. would you consider that, and you know, even, even if it isn't certain that you'll get the same ending every time? I mean, it depends. Like in, in Bioware's case, I would not because that game is clearly not a linear game. If it's been like, if it's been linear up to that point, like in, um, I guess, like in Halo. Four. In Halo 4, if you finish on Legendary, you get a sweet little cutscene of seeing Master Chief's wrinkly face without his eyes. Or, well, you see his eyes. His wrinkly little old man eyes. Um, <laughs> I'm still mad he's old. Um, and, uh, but only if you finish on Legendary, you don't get that cutscene otherwise. Um, but that game is, I would still consider that game very linear narrative. It depends on what the game is doing up to that point. Sweet. Um, but generally, that is still linear, if that makes sense, yeah. Any more questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. So how about the how about games like like Silent Hill Two or Silent Hill Series, where it's kind of like a massively linear game, but 
it's only up to the very end we have like these multiple endings and you don't know what exactly triggers those multiple endings until you look up like a game fact or whatever and then it says like oh if you it's the game like invisibly tracks like your actions and so if you do a certain thing like if you look if you keep looking at the letter of your dead wife over and over your character gets more depressed and you get like the suicide ending <laughs> if you get you know if you do the optimistic stuff you get off the they get you really don't know what's happening and so but that's the thing i like for me i would I would play that over and over, even if 99% of the game is linear, yeah. except for this tiny acknowledgement at the end. It's like, oh, by the way, you know, you look kind of sad. Here's a sad thing. Oh, look. I don't know. It's, hey, I'm just wondering, like, it's, it's a lot of, um, <laughs> giving thoughts and those kind of Um, there's a lot of, like, okay, so this is, like, kind of general, like, these are the blocks of what linear narrative and what other narratives are. Games often use different parts of different things, and like it's a mishmash. Like I said, Horizon Zero Dawn, it's a linear story, but the, like it has a linear narrative that you could just follow if you wanted. But it is an overall game that builds that narrative down to the open world. Um, it very much depends on the game, and like in that, like I would say it's mostly linear, but it does have aspects of branching then because it does do the branching thing. Um, but it's not, yeah, obviously that if it doesn't give you like. <laughs> like in-game like ideas of what you're doing is going to lead to a different ending um i think games that do that are cool but also like it fits the genre of it being a horror thing that does that like you couldn't really do that in like a general like action kind of story like call of duty kind of thing if you get in different endings because the player was like i'm going to kill this dude even though he's dead and it's like you're going to get a bad ending because of that like people would be mad they'd be like what the hell is this i didn't know this was going to happen um so you have to be aware of what your genre is and what what your players are going to do with that info yes something which is Pretty much that uh, games will sort of specifically Dishonored and Deus Ex, they have some effects based on exactly that how many uh, things you kill as opposed to avoid. Yeah. Um, sort of. Yeah, those games are crunching ish. Ish. From the mechanics side of it. It's, yeah, it's. Ultimately, a mixed style because it's yeah. a game again is ninety nine percent linear with like five minutes at the end that changes. You probably couldn't really study that effectively. As well. <coughs> it's, it's, yeah, it, it's really <laughs> it can be fun for like those kinds of games can be fun for those replayability. Really branching. Yeah, not really. Like they kind of do branching through the mechanics of how you play the game, but not really. Yeah, like it, it, yeah, like Maddie said, it's a mix of kind of both, and it uses like like I said, a lot of games. Aspects. Yeah, I think those ones like they design games like that, like Dishonored, can be fun because like if you go through and you kill like a lot of people, you play quite a bad playthrough, you get a different kind of way that you play the game, and the game reacts to that. Whereas if you don't do that, the game reacts differently. Um, kind of like Undertale does that too, I guess. Um, so. Yeah, it's got to be that. Okay, hang on, I'll finish my sentence. What was my sentence? Um, <laughs> so if you um, build it like that, that gives players a reason to play again and play it differently and experience it in a different way, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, would that be a kind of, I suppose, like completely backing on the Deus Ex and the Sun Tzu stuff, would that be a kind of, I guess, emergent narrative? Because you're still, the actual story that you do is, I suppose, linear. But it kind of the ending kind of recontextualizes your actions throughout the game, I guess. Or? Uh, um, kind of like emergent narrative is kind of a thing that like um, I mean it has established things with it, but it's a sort of thing of like you can kind of say a lot of things are emergent even when they're not or they are kind of. Um, I wouldn't say that it's because the endings are scripted to be that way when you play it that way. Um, so even though it's because of how you play and like your choices within mechanics, like and systems and stuff, as opposed to like story wise, it's still part of the story kind gotcha. of, um, and how how the story is, how you're contextualizing the story yourself. Um, like, yeah, emergent narrative is more like when you do weird shit in Skyrim and like weird shit happens. I mean, that's not actually emergent narrative. This is emergent mm -hmm. gameplay, but like it's like systems reacting to that and telling your story reacting off of that in a not entirely scripted way. Um, yeah. Sweet. Any more questions? Are we good? Oh, hello. Yeah. <coughs> Um, I've been thinking about this a lot. Is it actually a little bit arbitrary to talk about linear storytelling and non-linear storytelling where we've got a whole continuum in, in between? <laughs> and a lot of the time we end up using uh, basically doing multi-linear stories. So like, there's a general direct line, mm. but 
Yeah. Do you think that like, sort of trips people up, the whole kind of like, is it linear, is it nonlinear? I, I don't actually think this comes up super much. Like, it mainly comes up when people are talking about, like, emergent narrative, procedural narrative and stuff, and they're like, why would you make a game like The Last of Us when you could make a game like XCOM or whatever? Um, and it's kind of just a style, it's a taste thing, it's a style thing, and it's like what you want to make with games and what you ideally want to do. Um, so, I mean, my point of pointing all this out is because I'm like, these games are good and they have power, and this is how you use that power. Um, yeah, there is a lot, like, most games you'll notice if you go into them, like, when I was figuring out the chain narrative, I was like, is Pokemon a chaining narrative? I think it is. And, like, um, and like I was thinking about, like, her story, because I was going to put my list of, like, games that do it well. I was like, is her story linear narrative? I don't know what it is. I don't know where it's at. So it's like, you can hit games, you're just like, I don't know what the hell this game is. It just does stuff. Um, or you can have the games, and you can point out, like, it's one particular thing, like, Halo is just a linear narrative, because you go through shooting things. Um, or, like, Bioware is obviously a branching narrative, because you go through and you get different endings, depending on what you do. Um, but yeah, most games will have things in between. I mean, linear narrative doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a linear story as well. It can't be a non-linear story told in a linear narrative, um, if that makes sense. Like, it's, it's one story that goes through, but it's told non-linearly. I don't know what games do that, but it's a thing that you could do if you wanted to do. Edith yeah. Finch. Oh yeah, Edith Finch does that, yeah. Edith Finch is a great example. Of yeah, fit so much. <laughs> I love most of the, like, if you have played any of the games on my good games list, play them, especially if you care about narrative. Really good examples of narrative games. Oh, yeah, I'll go back to the list. This is going to take a while. Hang on. <laughs> Why did I use animation so much? I just loved them. I was like, this is so exciting. There we go. All of these games, really good example of narrative. Go play them if you haven't played any of them, or if you've played some of them. Play all of them, or just watch like a let's play of them. Um, all good. Very good. Sweet. Thank you for listening to my talk, but even if I don't know if it made sense, love you all. You're good.